Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Murphy, um, and I'm going to give a little bit of a biased presentation here about uh, my experience of going from C++ dev to going to Elixir dev. Um, so I'll start off by saying uh, this presentation is an advertisement. Um, if you meet these criteria, you're my target audience here. If you don't, you're welcome to come along and maybe I'll still sell, sell something to you. Um, you know, the, this is the nerves group. So we're mostly talking about uh, embedded hardware, embedded systems here. Um, and, you know, we're we're sitting in the area in, in the post Raspberry Pi world where we have single board computers with hundreds of megahertz, even sometimes gigahertz of clock speed, you know, hundreds of megabytes of RAM, gigabytes even sometimes. Um, and sometimes though, we still feel it's necessary to write C++ code. And um, in the modern day and age, uh, I feel like there's a lot of stuff that we're doing with C++ that you have to do to write the language um, that just doesn't fit a platform that has the kind of strength that that we're talking about with you know these modern embedded systems. Um, so before I go any further, uh, I'll say a little bit, who am I? Uh, so I am an embedded software engineer. Uh, at Gridpoint, we call ourselves the firmware team, but I think that's a misnomer. I'll, I'll mention that later. Um, but I've been working at Gridpoint since February of 2022. So uh, not even two years into my career, guys. Um, I have a lot of history in C. Um, I enjoy writing Python code. I understand why people don't like it, but I have a good time with it. I've written some C-sharp code recreationally. Um, I have tried many times to learn Haskell. I, I, I'm infatuated with the language. I think it's really cool. Never get far enough. I, it, it's just going to take more for it to click over with me. Uh, and my C++ experience uh, before beginning my career, undergrad, you know, seven years ago. Um, but coming into this, I kind of told myself, I said, well, it can't be that bad, can it? I, I know how to write C code, uh, C++, sure, there's classes, there's some template stuff, I understand, but it can't be that bad. Um, and I am almost a uh, contributor to to some Nerves repo. Um, I'm just waiting for Frank to merge my code. Frank, if you're watching this, merge my code. Thank you. Um, so so initially coming into my job, how did it feel for me to, to get comfortable with C++? Because I didn't really have the experience to begin with, uh, but it turns out, you know, my intuition was kind of correct. It's not that hard to start writing passable code in C++ as long as there's already a code base and with the C background. You, know, you follow the trail of types, you go into your IDE, and you say, jump to definition. And that'll get you pretty far. Um, and there's a lot of niceties that come along with that too, like maps being a type, which you, it's not real in C, um, although maybe in one of the newer specifications, I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, templates are the big thing in C++, right? And if, if you're just coming into it, you say, oh, they're really cool, but I'm just going to pretend they're generics. And other than that, it's black magic. Um, the, the standard features, you know, there's CPP reference. I think there are a couple of other sites that are effectively mirrors for that. Um, it's pretty well documented. They, they have good examples for all of the standard library stuff. Uh, and even if something still feels too overwhelming, you just write C code instead, uh, maybe literally C code, or you can use a C library. You know, if if you don't have a good grasp on uh, file operators and file stuff in C++, you can just F open and do, you know, F read and things like that if you feel like it's necessary. Uh, so there, there, you know, so your comfort level can, you can ease into it as you, as you get more comfortable with the code that you're working with. Um, so, so why do we write C and C++ code? Uh, in the past, historically speaking, um, those are your languages of choice when you need speed. And also historically speaking, embedded systems kind of needed all the speed that they could get. They needed all the memory efficiency. They needed, you know, every clock cycle possible. Um, and as a result, you know, we have, I don't even know how many years of precedence where when people are working with an embedded system, you're writing C code, you're writing C++ code. Um, if you try and look up references or, you know, information about what to do with it, those are the languages that you're going to find. Um, and C, especially, you know, that's that's the next level up from assembly, more or less. C++, on the other hand, a little bit farther from assembly, but still compared to, you know, the majority of other languages, blazingly fast, so much better. 
Um, and for the most part, that's because C++ compilers are black magic. Um, all credit, all power to the people that write those kind, that kind of compiler code. Incredible. Just blows my mind away. Um, you know, generally the way it works in C++ is it, the compilers will generate code that ends up looking a lot like C. And at that point, you know, C code is the fast stuff. So you, you're there. Um, so when we really truly need every single drop for firmware, we write C code. And if we're on an embedded system, we write C++ because we have niceties like maps and being able to have templates and, and, and nice things like that. Um, so, so I will circle back here and say, um, there's definitely a difference between writing firmware and writing embedded code. Um, just in case people aren't aware, uh, when I say firmware, I am referring to something that, to code that is meant to be loaded on a device, a single piece of hardware, and it controls the physical stuff about that hardware. You read your voltages, you set your current values, you do things like that. Anything else is built on top of that. Embedded software, on the other hand, uh, is going to control multiple pieces of hardware, all of which probably have their own little firmware running on them. Um, and a lot of the time, you can have an OS on your embedded system. However, it's not like you know a desktop or a laptop or a cloud service. Whew. Um, whatever you have on that board is what you have to work with. You can't download more RAM. You can't just borrow some compute time from someone else. What you have is what you have, and you have to deal with those constraints unless you have a new hardware revision. Um, so as I was thinking about this presentation, um, I kind of had a thought creep into my mind. It was the idea of the fundamental unit of programming. And the idea of the fundamental unit is when you're working with a language, um, what is the data type? What is the thing that you're working with that you're going to go to the most often? It's going to be your return value. It's going to be, you know, what your functions get passed in as arguments. You know, in C, we have pretty much two options. Everything is either a memory address or it's a return code. Um, if we're in Python, you know, we have dictionaries. Um, everything's a dictionary in Python. Uh, I'm going with it's a tuple in Elixir. There are options there. I'm sure other people have their own opinions on that. Um, you know, the functions in Haskell, everything's an object in Java, everything's a list in Lisp. Um, and so you might ask yourself, well, what's the fundamental unit of C? And if you're asking that question, then you've already arrived at the answer because the fundamental unit of C++ is the question. And here are a couple of very real questions that I have asked in the process of my development early on at GridPoint, um, just trying to feel my way around the code base and figure out what's going on. Um, it's a mess. There's so much. You know, when you're writing a function, it's not just, um, is this code going to do what I want it to do? But it's, is this the right way to do it? Have these library features been um, replaced by a newer library or a newer convention? Uh, what in the world is uh, standard enable if? I know what standard enable if is, but like it, there's there's so much you have to go through that before you can have your code working, uh, you have to get all of your ducks in a row for all of the concepts. And it has to be the right ones. because Stack Overflow is only going to tell you what the right ones are. Um, so good luck. Um, so, so yeah, I, I have some gripes. Um, you know, one of them is that, uh, C++ was built to, or it has grown, I'll say, to include every feature of every programming language, not literally, but pretty, pretty much, um, you know, we're going to like, we're going to ignore prologue. That's for the purpose of this discussion. Um, and as a result of having all of these features, you, there are too many ways to solve your problem. Um, and which way the right way is, is going to depend. Every person is going to have a different right way to do it. Um, and some of the features that they implement in the language just feel, I mean, they, you read the documentation and it feels like it was hacked in. Um, not that an undergrad could ever write compiler code, but it feels like an undergrad was like, okay, here's how we're going to have the compiler take care of this thing. Um, if anyone's ever read the documentation on uh, C++ coroutines, it feels like a hacked and hard-coded solution. Um, and if you don't like those uh, built-in language features, you go to Boost. Well, uh, the Boost documentation is not great, and it's a testing environment. Um, the examples are generally uh, very specific examples. It's like, if you want your code to do this specific thing, 
here's how you use this boost library to do it. Um, and it's a header library. I don't know if anyone here has tried to read header libraries. Whew. Um, and additionally, you know, thread management, this is not a C++ problem. This is a low level programming language problem where uh, figuring out how to share your data across multiple threads it becomes a big logistics problem. And that's just between threads under a process. We're not even talking about IPC. IPC is a whole different deal. Um, that's just, whew, that's a real mess. Um, and the end result of all of these things is that you spend so much time thinking and working on your implementation of the code um, and compared to how much time you spent thinking of the solution for it, right? Your, your conceptual solution versus what are the lines of code I need to put down to make this happen. Um, and I ran out of space on this slide, but I'll say as well, um, you know, the templates have grown so much in C++. Um, they have the auto keyword now, and that kind of stands for itself it, you know oh the readability is bad the compiler is bad that you know people say oh the, those are lazy complaints but like if you have auto as a keyword for a language that was meant to be strongly typed just because your type names are getting so out of hand it's it's something you know that's that's a real thing to think about um but there's a solution to all of this in c plus plus it's an easy solution uh get good right just learn the language and and you're fine um but but you got to stay on top of it right um, I actually spent some time looking this up. It was standard auto pointer that got deprecated. They introduced a smart pointer feature and a couple of releases later, they said, actually, this is not the way to do smart pointers. Um, we're going to give you a different, a different smart pointer type instead. Um, and you know, if you stop writing the language for a couple of years, you're going to have years worth of patch notes and documentation and all the discussions to go through to get caught back up. And that's just reading about them and not even necessarily seeing how it's happened in practice. Um, so staying on top of C++ and really being the expert is uh, is a calling unto itself, pretty much. Um, so that was my experience. It, it wasn't bad. It was cumbersome. It was a lot of work for problems that I feel like I should have been able to solve within a much shorter time span mostly because I was trying to wrangle the language, partly due to my inexperience, partly due to the way the language has grown. Um, but after uh, about half a year, maybe a little bit more of doing that, um, there were some changes at the company. Uh, you know, Alex mentioned uh, Mike Ratliff and, and you know, the whole, um, everything that's happened. Um, so the we started developing some new server code. It was using the Phoenix framework. It's all Elixir. Uh, so, well, how about we talk Elixir on the client end as well? How about our embedded software is using Elixir as well? Um, so the the assessments were done, and we determined, yep, our hardware platform is good enough. We can we can run the beam on this. We can get some Elixir code going. Uh, so eventually, the call was made. We're getting rid of the C plus plus code base. We're going to take all of those problems and rewrite it in Elixir. Um, and the code base is probably not ancient in terms of C++, but uh, we had our own implementations for date time, for threads, for scoped locks. I mean, it was old. There were many features that had made it into the standard library that weren't there when the code base was initially developed. So there was a lot of old, crusty stuff we were throwing out. Um, so the biggest thing, the, the first thing I really had to pick up on for this um, is the mindset shift for writing Elixir code. Um, I think this is really Erlang's unofficial motto, but by by extension, Elixir's unofficial motto is let it crash. Um, and you know, your C-like languages are um, be prepared. Anything can happen. You can get any result, so you better be ready for all the possibilities. And it's particularly difficult because if you don't handle your errors in that language, you lose your whole program. The whole thing goes down. All of your threads, gone. Whatever they stored in memory, gone. So it might be a case of needing exception handlers for everything, or it might be a case of persisting your stuff to the database You know, every time anything changes, or writing stuff over the network to a more stable location every time anything changes. Um, but that's the mindset in those languages, is we need to be prepared because stuff can go wrong, and that would be very bad. Uh, but but we're, we're on embedded systems here. And on embedded systems, the whole platform is on lockdown, right? 
you should be customizing, you know, if it's Linux, right, your your Linux that's running on the on the device. Um, and it should pretty much just be your program that's running and maybe a couple of other little helper things. Um, so if something outside of your control breaks, that's a real problem. Uh, the comparison would be, you know, think about your mom's computer. She's got Chrome open. She's running Facebook, maybe something from the Microsoft Office suite is open. She's got two Bitcoin viruses in the background that are doing things. And like, yeah, in a situation like that, maybe we're not in total control of the system. And so we should be a little bit more defensive and careful. But on an embedded platform, if something went wrong, I want to know exactly what went wrong and exactly the first place that it happened. Um, and Elixir is great for that because that's the goal is let it crash. We'll figure it out after that. So we're going to do a little bit of um, code example in C++, and these are all just going to be tiny toys because it's one slide. Um, there'll be a little thing in C++ and an approximate equivalent in Elixir as well. So, you know, easy example. We have this little C++ function. It, it opens up a file, um, and it's going to do something with that file once the file is open. Um, but it would be really bad if we tried to do something with that file and it wasn't opened, right? So we're going to open it, and then we're going to save in our object whether or not the file was actually opened. Uh, if it was, we'll do stuff with it. If it wasn't, we're going to say, hey, we couldn't do it, and we're going to let the caller know whether we succeeded or failed at that operation. Um, by comparison, in Elixir, here's what we do. And there's there's some some, you know, arcane. There's some uh, not immediately understandable things going on here, but we we try to open our file and we're going to read from it. And essentially what we're saying here is this has to succeed. If this doesn't succeed, this line of code gives us an error, program goes down. So when we start doing other stuff with our file handle, we know if we hit this line of code, we had a successful file open. No problems in sight yet. Um, and then this line is essentially the equivalent of uh, writing back to a field in your class is essentially you know what we're doing here. Um, and so that's the whole thing. So if there was a problem, we will know about it at the instant that the file failed to open. Uh, you know, going back to this, right? If our file fails to open, we let the caller know that it failed, and then the caller is maybe going to do some other stuff and get into a different state as a result. You know, it's it's not able to uh, write some user entered data to disk. Um, but now we have to keep track of that, right? We're going to have to know, was I able to successfully open the file? Is it currently open at any point in time? Uh, whereas here, if we failed, that's it, the end. Um, and so you might rightfully be saying, well, OK, but if this crashes, then you still have a dead program, right? You haven't solved any problems. In fact, you've just made it more likely that your code's going to go down. And that would be true, except that the threading model in Elixir um, allows us to do these sorts of things with supreme ease compared to C++. So the Beam VM has an M to N thread model, which I adore. I think it's I think it's the correct way to do things. Um, inside of the VM, it has its own idea of threads. There's M of them, and that is going to correspond to N actual threads in the operating system or on hardware or however however it gets chopped up otherwise. Um, but they don't have to be the same. You know, it could be a single hardware thread handling all of the virtual Elixir threads, and then it's essentially sequential execution, yada, yada. Um, but Elixir processes are, are meant to be small, and the VM manages message passing between all of the threads, all of the processes. Um, and the idea is a message gets sent to a process, it goes into that process's mailbox, and it is now the responsibility of that process to read the message and do something with whatever the message contained. Um, and it's, you know, it's a common pattern, right? If you think about what threads do, there are two options. It's either a thread that does something and dies. You know, it was spawned and you say, do this function. And it does the function and then it's, it's done. Or it's a thread that sticks around and receives a signal, does stuff with the signal, and then it goes back to waiting for more signals. So, you know, that that read of our reply pattern is very common. And so the Elixir standard library says, yeah, I got you. Don't worry about it. Um, since everything is message passing, of course, our standard library is going to have frameworks for that. That's no problem. Uh, the most common of which is the gen server. Um, the idea is 
that instead of having to manage the whole process of reading from the mailbox and figuring out what the message is, these frameworks will expose, they'll, they'll handle the job of reading from the mailbox and they will expose the contents of the message for you so that all that you need to write is a callback handle and it'll call your function. And then you can just say, here's what I want to do if I receive this message. So, so we have this idea of all of these different um, logical threads running in the VM and Elixir lets you link processes to one another. Uh, this is, you know, kind of at the level of signal handlers in C++. Um, if uh, one thread, something happens to a thread, anything else that's linked to it will receive a message that says, hey, something happened to this thread. It's a sig child, basically. That's what I was looking for. Um, so you can not write a handler to deal with that message. And if you don't write a handler, then whoever received the message is also going to crash because they don't know what to do with the data. Or you can write a handler for that message and then you can do something. And that leads to the idea of the supervisor model, which certainly you can write in, in C like code in C++, um, but you have to write it. <laughs> um, and you have to think about message passing and, and the whole deal. Um, but the idea of the supervisor model is that one process is kind of the parent over all of the children, and it links to all the children that it creates. If a child dies, the supervisor will catch that message and do something with it. Usually you try to restart the process. Um, if you succeed, great. Your program did not crash. You lost a single small, right? Small module of, execu of execution. That's the, that's the Elixir goal here. You lost a small module of execution, but it was able to get back up and it's doing the correct thing again. So something might've gone wrong, but it's not going wrong anymore because the process is now doing stuff. Um, and if it, if it can't, if it tries five times to restart a process and the process dies immediately, time after time after time, supervisor blows up because now we have a real problem. Something is bad with the system. This process that's supposed to be doing a job can't do its job. We got to let people know what's up. Um, so, so that kind of that kind of mindset of uh, let it fail, small little modules deal with the messages. Um, it, that's that was kind of the introduction. That was that was the beginning of the learning process. Um, and one thing that I found very quickly is that compared to other functional languages, Elixir really just lets you write code. Um, if any of you have ever written Haskell code, first of all, congratulations. Um, second of all, I think that nobody in the history of the world has ever said, yeah, I'm going to sit down and crank out a prototype in Haskell real quick. It just doesn't happen, um, you know, or in Lisp, although maybe there are some people who have done it in Lisp, maybe. Um, but in Elixir, you can just sit down, you can use intermediate variables for as long as you want. You can make every step as tiny as necessary, um, and you can just prove that it runs. And you know you'll you'll get a feeling you'll you'll say oh this is a lot of work this is a lot of steps I should you know uh, I should cut this down at some point but you can just do it um, and another thing that I was really enjoying is it, just being able to do the general function thing you know the it, everything's mathematical they're mathematical functions it's it's all lists you you have a map over things um, I really enjoyed that especially because I could write code at my own pace that wasn't the most beautiful thing ever. It wasn't the perfect platonic ideal of a function like you have to have in Haskell, but I could just get something out there and it worked. Um, and so what I ended up really appreciating is the idea of pattern matching. Everything is pattern matching in Elixir. Um, even even your functions, right? Your, even your functions are, are pattern matched. And the idea behind that is Essentially, you have a list of function pointers, um, and then the Elixir is going to go from top to bottom, and it's going to try to evaluate each of the functions. And it's not just the function itself, but the arguments to that function. So I can specify that a function takes one, the number one, as an argument. And if someone calls that function and they don't pass it the number one, well, then it's going to skip that function pointer, and it's going to try to move on to do the next one instead. And if that one says any number, then it'll run that one with one as the argument. Um, so 
and we'll see in a second, it really lets you break down your functions into much smaller units. Um, additionally, I really appreciate that you cannot partially apply your functions. You can, but it's not the correct way to do it. Um, you have to work way too hard in Elixir to make it happen. Um, and that's that's a big readabil readability benefit to me. Um, you're not what, you know, there's no like, oh, this was a partially applied function. It's being passed off to some other function that I wasn't expecting it to go to. But because the arguments match, it, it's partially applied. So it's allowed to happen. Um, no, functions have one arity. You know, they take the arguments that they take. And if you see that function called, you can know exactly what's going into it. And and this idea of of pattern matching and, and all of that is is extremely uniform, even if, right? If is a function. Um, you, you know, in C++, we might say, uh, if X is true, then Y equals five. Um, but in Elixir, we would have to say Y equals if X is true, return five. Um, and if you don't do that, then you haven't actually updated anything. Um, so as an example, uh, here's this tiny little, this toy little C++ function here. Uh, it examines, it examines an input number. And it lets us lets us know some fun facts about that number, depending on what the number is. Um, and there's really not a good way to do this. Um, you kind of have to have the equivalent of if the number's this, else if the number's this, else if the number's this. Um, and the comparison isn't great here because it's such a small toy piece of code. Um, but you can see, you know, if we want to know what we're doing for our numbers, like. It's a whole it's a whole switch statement, right? We gotta we gotta really start going through it all. Um and the comparison in Elixir, I admit, looks very similar. Um, but now each of our functions is broken out into a single individual function, right? We have what does examine number do when ex when the argument is 777? What does it do when the argument is 13? Uh, by comparison on C, we don't get that from the definition. We don't get what does examine number do if input input is anything. Whereas here we can explicitly say what our argument is, what we do. Argument, action. Um, or we have our frail safe, which matches with any variable. Um, and then we'll say, well, that's a boring number. And, and you know, that's kind of our catch-all at, at the bottom, the, the equivalent of our default. Um, my first real selling point, the first thing that got me excited about Elixir was the binary pattern matching. Um, you know, you see it said all the time in C and C++ circles. Uh, if you want to look at the bits of something, you got to write C. You got to write C++ code. Uh, good luck doing that in Python. Uh, you can do it in other languages, but it's it's meant to be done in C. Um, in my opinion, it's easier in Elixir than it is even in C and C++. And the reason for that is that it does just the right amount of abstraction so that you don't have to worry about your masks, you don't have to worry about your bit shifts. Um, I believe in the Beam VM, all numbers are stored big endian. Although, you know, if you're reading like network data, it's gonna be different or whatever. Um, so you, your question about uh, what platform am I on, what does the endianness look like goes away. Um, you know, you're not thinking about sign bits or anything like that. Um, and additionally, it just lets you match with the rest of the binary data you know you can say give me the first three bytes and i'll deal with the rest of it uh, at a later point in time so you know this kind of pattern is great for binary data and also for numbers right so it, so it kind of works in, in both ways um so here's here's a little bit of honestly this is c code this isn't even c plus plus code um we have a uint 32 it's secretly some masked data i don't know where we pulled it from but we want to look at the top three bits, and then we also want to split the entire thing into two separate shorts. Um, so, you know, uh, depending on your endianness, this stuff is going to be different. Uh, but you know, shift it all the way down, and then mask out, you know, um, the top three bits, right? Or uh, here's a arcane. I admit this is not a very arcane number to anyone who has worked on this for more than a day but you know here's an arbitrary number that i'm going to use to extract out some of the data that i'm looking for or if you're feeling really cheeky uh you just do some pointer logic which also works um and and you know for both of the shorts 
And then once we finally put a little bit of voodoo into our program, we can take our results and uh, pass it over to the next processing function. Uh, by comparison, uh, here's how we might have this function work in Elixir. Uh, this when statement here is essentially the equivalent of specifying a uint32 type, right? The byte size is four, it's, a, it's an int32. Um, but now I don't care about signs. I don't care about shifting anything. I'm gonna say, here's my input. I want to match three bits, and then I want to match the rest of it that I don't really care about. And the three bits that I match, I'm gonna name that thing top three. I'm gonna say again, all right, well, here's my input. Now I want to match 16 bits. I'm gonna call that, you know, the high, the high value, the high short. Um, and then I also wanna match the next 16 bits. I wanna call that the low short. Um, there's no masking. There's no weird OXFF going on. Um, you know, no, no bit shifts. You just say, here's what I want. Here's where I expect it to be. Let me know what the data is. Um, significantly more readable and understandable than uh, some of the crazy bit level magic that you see going on in some C and C++ programs. Um, another thing that really resonated with, with me quite well in Elixir is the idea of the pipeline. So it's a two character operator. Um, that's, it looks like a nose, it's a pipeline. Um, and essentially it works like a Unix pipe. You take the output from the left-hand side function and whatever that output is becomes the first argument on the right-hand side function. And you can chain those together and make pipelines as long as you want, just like you can make you know a, a command in bash that's like 50 programs long. And the reason that this works so well is that in Elixir, the convention is that your big chunk of data is always the first argument to your function. So if we're doing date time stuff, the actual date time is the first argument. If we're doing, uh, I don't know, file operations, the file handle is the first argument. Um, those are all the examples I have. Um, and, but using pipelines like this allows you to focus on the names of the functions and not the names of the data that we're passing in, right? We know what the data we're passing in is. We, I mean, we have to specify that at least once. But then from there, it's more about what are we doing? How are we transforming this data through the pipeline as opposed to what are all the intermediate variables and like, let me make sure that this is the right pointer I'm passing around and all that. Um, and it, it, in some ways it feels C-like, you know, if you think about your, uh, the file functions is kind of what came to mind to me because like you're always passing in the file pointer to your file functions. Um, it's always getting modified in place. You don't really see inside of it. Um, but the pipeline is just like a strict improvement over that because now you only have to worry about the name of your pointer at the beginning of the pipeline and, and not anymore after that. Um, so here's the slide that took me the most time to figure out. Uh, it's a little toy function. We want to know, is tomorrow happening soon? And soon in this case is two hours and 30 minutes into the future. So what are we gonna do in C++? Well, uh, we're gonna use standard chrono, which is pretty new. Um, and if we were doing it before then, we would use the Howard Hinton date time library. Um, but we get our current local time. Uh, I admit this code reads pretty nicely, although our operator overloading is not something that should be done in my opinion. Um, but it's, it's not too bad, right? We take now, we add two hours, we add 30 minutes, cool. Um, but now how do we know if tomorrow is happening soon? The best solution I could find after like 30 minutes of looking around is we round these ambiguous, strongly typed, but we don't know what type they are, um, objects. We're going to round them down. We're going to round them down to the day value because templates just let you do that apparently. Um, and then once we've rounded them down to days, we can do an equality check. And if the two things are equal, um, I might have messed up my logic here. It's fine. Um, you know, if the two things are equal, then we know that tomorrow is not happening soon. If they're not equal, then we know that the future, the 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 future floor, must have ticked over to tomorrow. So when it rounded down, it was on the new day. Comparison here in Elixir, just a little bit of pipelining, um, partially because I couldn't think of a, a nice generic example. Um, so what are we going to do? We're going to Grab now, good. 
And we're going to take now and we're going to shove it through a short little pipeline here. First part of the pipeline, add two hours. Second part of the pipeline, add 30 minutes. Um, and because uh, Elixir is a little bit more transparent than trying to dive through uh, C++ objects, we can just check the days. We don't have to do any weird rounding logic here. We just say, do the days equal each other? Um, and if they do, then tomorrow isn't soon. Uh, I think I messed my logic up between these two functions. But the idea is there. Um, and this, so I admit, this pipeline really replaces this now plus two hours plus 30 minutes. Um, but the flip side to that is every single line in this function it has to do with what we're actually doing. It's all pretty legible, and all the characters contribute meaningfully um, to what we're actually trying to accomplish in this function. Uh, not quite so much the case here. Um, so we'll talk about you know a couple of the features that that we use in Elixir. Uh, perhaps one of the most omnipresent is the atom, um, and an atom is basically a map between a string to a number. It's kind of like a permanent enum is the way that I think about it. Um, so atoms are addressed with colons. And so essentially what that means is in our lookup table, OK maps to some number in our lookup table. It's a very fast lookup table. On compilation, it gets filled with as many values as the system is aware of. Um, and it completely re replaces your return codes, right? We no longer need to return 0 on success. We return OK. We can have as many error codes as we want, and it's, uh, first of all, it's nice and polite because it's in lowercase. Um, and also, you know, it's 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 just a little a little bit cleaner than having to jump to some header file that's three directories away, and you know, scroll through, who knows how many pages of conditional defines based on what your platform is. Um, it's just error, or could not find. Um, and this is going to work quite well with tuples as well, which we're going to get to right after the atom. Uh, so, for example, uh, here's some some little toy C++ code here. We're, I couldn't even think of a good name. We're just doing a foo. We're updating some data in our struct. Um, again, this is really C code. Um, but we have our data, and we have our struct we want to update. So we're going to check, is the data less than 100? If it is, the data is just not enough. Um, we got a bad reading. Uh, something like that, right? So we're going to say, hey, value is too low, and we're going to return a macro for a non-zero number. Don't know what it is, kind of don't care for this example. Um, otherwise, if the data was strong enough, we're going to update our data with the new value. I'm going to add it in there, and we're going to return a macro for zero. Now, I do have a minor nitpick here that I understand why it's the case, um, but it seems weird to me that our success value evaluates to false. It feels like success should be true. Um, but here we are. I get I get it. You have way more error cases than you have success cases. So it makes sense for success to be falsy because there's only one zero, it's zero. Um, but it's just always felt a bit weird to me. Uh, by comparison, though, over here in Elixir land, here's one way that we might do something like this. Uh, you know, we have we have our data, we have our input, and we'll say, OK, let's check what does input greater than 100 evaluate to? If it evaluates to true, then we will grab a new value and we will do two things. We will say, okay, we will return two things. We will say, okay, and we will return our struct updated with the new data. Um, however, if input greater than 100 did not return true, false, um, we don't care, but it's false, um, then we're going to say error, weak data. And it's worth noting here, um, we have two non-matching returns, and that's okay. Because we're doing pattern matching, we can pattern match on both of them. I can pattern match on error, weak data, and I can pattern match on okay something, right? And that's fine. Elixir just says, you're good, go for it. So the tuple, and we'll step back here for a moment, right? This is a tuple. This is a tuple. It's a collection of data, exactly like what you would expect it to be. It can hold any type elements inside of it, including more tuples, lists, maps, module names, atoms, numbers, strings. That's about everything. Um, they're fixed size. 
you know, you say, here's what my tuple is going to hold. That's what it's holding. Um, read only once made, although I guess this is a bit of an important point. I'll stick it in here right now. Um, everything in Elixir is read only with very, very few exceptions. I believe there are references sometimes, but by and large, everything is passed by value, returned by value. And, uh, you know, the, the system we're working on is what, 128 megabytes of memory. Um, we, there are no memory problems. The garbage collector does its job and it does its job well. Um, pass by value is safe. Okay. That aside is done. Um, so yes, everything is read only, but you can't modify a tuple at all. You're creating a brand new tuple. Um, a lot of the times they're used as return values so that we can get multiple pieces of data back to the caller. And they're even more generic than structs are uh, for reasons that we're about to see in a second here. So if we were trying to return multiple values in C or C++, there are a couple of ways that we might do it. Uh, we might have a struct return result that has an int RC. That's the first thing in the struct. And it has a void pointer value, which is the second thing in the struct. This one's got to be an int. This one's got to be a void pointer. That's just how it is. Um, alternately, we could have our function defined to take a void pointer as the first argument. And this one's going to be in out because we have to read from it. But also because it's a return value, we need to be able to write to it. So we'll return our status code, but we'll also update the contents of this. And the caller understands. Well, I have this pointer. They're going to update some data for me, and I can just use it again as normal later. Uh, a little bit of a more idiomatic C++ way is now we have the standard tuple, and you can shove as many types as you want inside of this templating. Have fun with that. Um, and now that we've done that, we also really want to make sure that people understand that this argument is for input only. So it's a constant pointer to a constant value, um, just to really make sure that people know we're not touching data inside of here. Um, we're going to return whatever it is otherwise. So there's not really an equivalent in Elixir, but here are some things that that we might use our tuple our tuples for. Um, the most common, I would say, possibly ever, is OK value. That's right up there with error and the name of an error. Um, or we might say, here's a here's another tuple. It has a command and the thing that we want to do with that command and some other data for good measure. Um, or we can throw a list in there. We can start throwing maps in there as well. And this map is going to have the name of some other module that we're going to do something with. Um, very flexible. There's no naming. There's no important ordering, except insofar as you have to do pattern matching in the future. That's, that's really up for you to decide. Um, so the you know and and that's a lot of stuff that's in code that's very easy to work with and it it kind of all just starts falling into place um but the the conventions as well right like i mentioned with function function arguments um they're made to work with the pipeline the pipeline is a feature and people write their code with an understanding that that feature is going to be used um, another really good convention is that you try and pattern match as possible as you can to make it very explicit about what's happening um, in specific cases. Instead of needing 15 lines of if statements and argument checking at the top of your function, you just write a different function that matches different arguments. And um, the the pipeline as well really, in my opinion, helps create this idea of layers inside of your program. Uh, and it's it's very Unix-like, honestly. Uh, every layer is a very small thing that is a very specific task. And you take all these small things that do specific tasks and you compose them together and build them up into larger things. So for example, we have a receive data layer. We have a validate data layer. We have a process data layer. We have a send data layer. You're not gonna validate and then try to send. You're gonna validate and then process. And if process fails, we're not going to like jump back up to the receive part and go back up the chain in the appropriate order. Um, and having just the pipeline operator and being able to think about separating your code out like that 
really helps with the readability of every individual function. Um, there's no random database writes happening inside of your validation function. Um, there's no, like, what if something comes down on the network in the middle of processing data? That's that's a separate thing. Um, and it makes it very obvious to a reader exactly what's going on at any point in time. Um, another really another really enjoyable thing, which is the standard in almost every language, uh, is the package manager, or, or being able to easily host and access packages. Um, it hosts code, it hosts documentation. Um, you can have your own private instance of Hex that you host yourself, or you can pay for private packages on the actual Hex. Um, and it's great because once you install the Hex package to your system, um, now you have complete integration with your configs. In your config, you say, I want this package, I want this version, you know, the same config file as the rest of the stuff for your project. And it just goes out and downloads it from the repo. And it's great. It works. No problems whatsoever. Probably. Um, now that said, right, I've said I, I've said a lot of things here. I did I did say this would be a biased presentation. Um, but Elixir still doesn't feel perfect to me. Um, one of the things that I had a lot of problems overcoming, and I still do have troubles with, is that you can't really mid-function return. Now, there are solutions to this. One is that anytime you want to mid-function return, you break out into two fun you break out into a new function. And if you're in the don't mid-function return case, then you go into that function. And if you're at the mid-function return case, then you the function just ends there and you return. Um, and that works, but if you actually wrote your code that way, you would have tons and tons of really tiny functions and your stack traces would be atrocious. It would just it would it would be very difficult to debug and figure out exactly where stuff was going wrong. Um, or it would be a lot to track. Uh, another alternative is a with block. So a with block is essentially a way to say, um, try and do all of these pattern matches and tell me if any of them don't succeed. And you can then do a pattern match on a failed pattern match is the best way that I can think to explain it. So if you have a whole bunch of lines inside of your with statement, you can then have special cases for when any given one of them fails. You say, well, the first pattern match failed. I want to do this. Oh, the second one failed. Let's do this instead. And that's effectively like getting mid-function returns. Um, but personally, I feel like they, they just don't look elegant. They don't feel as nice. Um, I, I didn't talk about macros at all in, in Elixir. Um, and that is because I respect them and I fear them, and they are powerful, and they are black magic. Um, probably even more so than in C and C++. Um, when, when, you, when people write macros in Elixir, um, essentially, the Elixir compiler will break the code down into an abstract, abstract syntax tree, an AST, and it will hand that AST representation to some of the macro code. And the macro code can then take that AST and compile it into uh, actual useful code. So what ends up happening is if you are using a library that has some real macro black magic going on, it can introduce its own language entirely. All new keywords, all new functionality, all within there, because um, regular standard Elixir is just going to take the representation of whatever that code is and pass it off to the new stuff. Um, so you get entirely new keywords, entirely new layouts, ways to format your code. Um, and if there's too much of that, it's uh, you're learning a new language at that point. Is it is it even really Elixir? Um, looking at you, Phoenix devs, is it really Elixir or is it Phoenix that you're writing? Um, uh, excuse me. Um, and also, uh, if you're not careful with your variables, uh, particularly if you don't pattern match enough, uh, it can get it can be easy to get lost in exactly what variables you're working with and what values they can take. And you're gonna have to jump back three functions to figure out, oh wait, here are the options for things that can get passed into these functions. Uh, and documentation certainly helps with that. Um, but also, 
you're you're if you're trying to write a type spec for a function, you can sometimes have really deeply nested levels of stuff, and we get lazy with our documentation, and we say, if I wrote all this out, it would not be easy to read anyways. So we're just going to, even in our type spec, we'll say uh, it's a map, and we're not going to say what goes in there. So it can be difficult sometimes to figure out exactly uh, what the possibilities are if you're returning to code that you wrote in the past or someone else did. Um, so we'll wrap up here. I'm only at 50 minutes. Um, that's better than I was expecting. Um, so mastering and maintaining C++ code, it's a lot. It is kind of a profession itself. And you end up getting so into the weeds about how to write the code that does the stuff that, you know, the, the split between solving the problem and writing the code that solves the problem um, becomes a bad ratio. And on, even on modern embedded systems, the performance you gain you get from writing that C++ code uh, doesn't matter, right? So if I have a thread that sleeps for five seconds and then it wakes up and does something, I guarantee you that no matter what the language is, if I'm running it on a modern embedded hardware, a piece of a modern piece of embedded hardware, that thread's going to sleep for five seconds. And then at 5.001 seconds, it's going to be back asleep because it did whatever it needed to do, um, with some exceptions, sure. But for the most part, whatever language you're using, it you're not going to see the real gains. Now, if you're writing the firmware for like a pacemaker or something like that, please continue to use C. You have my blessing. Um, but if you're working on something Raspberry Pi-like, what performance gain are you really getting? And Elixir gives us a lot of really powerful syntactical tools. Um, the standard library is well developed around a lot of the concepts that we want to work with, like highly multi-threaded environments. I missed multiple points about the threading, about the multi-threading. Ugh. Um, and it lets you focus more on what your code is trying to do rather than uh, what your types are and how you need to manipulate the minutia of the detail. And, you know, surprisingly, maybe not too surprisingly, because it's Erlang, um, but you get pretty good low-level access. You can do stuff down in the guts of it. Now, down in the guts of it doesn't mean with pointers, because we got rid of pointers for good reason, um, for, for very good reason. Um, but, you know, if you want to get into the, the bits and the bytes of all the stuff and, you know, uh, write a program that decodes PNG files or something like that, you can do that. You can just get into the binary data and start going through it. Um, and the threading model is hands down the best threading model that I've seen. Now, I understand that in the Beam VM, it's doing the stuff, right, that you have to do in C and C++ code. But that's the beauty of it, right? They solved that problem. They did it, right? Good job, Beam devs. Congratulations. We're all so thankful. Um, now that you've done that, I can focus on writing my code and not having to write, you know, a, a supervisor in C++ that catches all of these signals and has to decode the information. And, ugh, right? Um, I can just do what I want to do. That's beautiful. I love it. Um, and that is all she wrote. Do we have any questions? I'm curious. So you don't have to sell me on why Elixir is going to be more fun to work with or <laughs> than than C++, but I'm really curious about the rest of the experience as far as like mm -hmm. deploying code. Um, That's fair. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm and I'm curious how they compare. I actually don't have an opinion. I'm not trying to get you to like, I really genuinely sure, sure. want to know yeah, your yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, so my experience in, in C++ world, and this is not quite so much deploying code, although my experience with deploying code in C++ is um, hopefully not everyone's experience <laughs> deploying C++ code. <laughs> um, but I, I, I will certainly talk about the build process. I feel like that's adjacent mm -hmm. enough and it kind of gets us there. Yeah, and I think that's um, really ultimately what I was going for is like yeah, just any sure. of the processes or the experiences outside of the actual language the itself. Actual code writing. Yeah. yeah. So so um, the, the great thing about building code in C and C++ is that the make file will do whatever you want it to do, right? You can have uh, dependencies that are on a different file system. They're on someone else's computer, and they'll <laughs> figure it out, right? Like, you can make it happen. 
um, you can have your libraries wherever they need to be and like it'll work it out. Um, and there, there are a couple of build systems. Um, I forget what we used initially. Uh, PTX Dist, I think. And then eventually we started using Mison instead. And I, I enjoyed Mison because it started stripping away some of those options. Um, and I think that that kind of really encapsulates a lot of the ideas of, of you know, these C-like languages is uh, we want you to have the freedom to do anything regardless of whether or not it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and the Mison build system, for example, uh, doesn't let you do whatever you want. Nice to have some uh, gentle nudging though, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it has some restrictions <laughs> in place. It says, you know, uh, your files need to be like this. I want you to tell me every single file that's going to be compiled, right? Don't you dare use a wildcard on me. Um, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, by comparison in Elixir, the way that it works... And I'm not a big master of, of config files yet, but the way that it works is you say, okay, here's how I want my project to be configured. I need, these are the dependencies I need. Um, you know, read the system environment, check for some variables. If the variable is this, then I want you to configure things this way or that way. Um, and other than that, all that I do is I say mix firmware, right? Um, and Obviously, all you do in C is you say make or you know the, mm -hmm. whatever your alias for make is. Yeah. Um, but reading the config files, figure like like you know, Alex can probably attest to this. Like I've I've started kind of digging around in the config files and like and like brushing stuff up or starting to set stuff. Um, mm -hmm. It would take me like at least another year before I felt confident modifying a, a C make file or something like that. Um, yeah. It's significantly easier just to get into it. Um, and as far as deploys go, um, you know, we are running on the Nerves platform, mm -hmm. right? So for us, it's as simple as, you know, you go into the GUI and you say, deploy these devices, right? Um, and our, you know, our CD, right, just builds based on whenever we tag for a release. So it does the build, it uploads it to Nerves Hub. Um, and we don't have to worry too much about that. Yeah. Um, I can't remember the specifics of like our deploy, you know, deploy to server process mm -hmm. um, in C++, good. but yeah. my my gut tells me it was not fun. And the reason I don't know anything about it is because it was too much. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fair enough. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I have two questions, actually. Oh, that's too many, buddy. Sorry. Okay. Do you want the fun <laughs> question or the less less fun um, question first? No, give me both. Give me both. Um, we'll okay. start with fun, though. Start with fun. Okay. Um, do you remember anything that you learned in Elixir or something? And you're like, this is just stupid. And then you kind of came around and you're like, okay, I understand why they did that. Um, let's see. So I think actually, and, and I mentioned it is, is if, right. Mm -hmm. If for the first, it, it got me a couple of times where I nilled something out, um, because, you know, you have to say, uh, if else, you know, or unless else, right? If you're if yeah. you're saving a value, um, you need to have you need to have an else to that to return your failure value. And, and a couple of times, I definitely stored some nils that shouldn't have been stored because I forgot the else. Um, but I get it. Like that's that's a little bit cumbersome, but it fits. It makes sense. Yeah, sometimes you just want to fire off a side effect or something, and you're like, I don't really right. care what happens. Yeah, and and really, that's what if and unless are for is for firing off side effects, um, in my mind at least, right? If if you want to be storing stuff, then do you know a proper enumeration? Say, here's a case we're saving the value, um, which is my take. I'm not an Elixir pro. I don't know if you've gathered, um, but I, I feel like I feel like if and unless are do side effects. Otherwise, don't touch them. Makes sense. Uh, and then, you know, I think another thing people always talk about, I hear about in the transition is sort of mostly testing, but then maybe also a little bit like running locally. But I think probably testing is the big one I hear about. Any thoughts on that? Ooh, yeah. Um, I definitely have thoughts on that. And again, you know, my thoughts are, are tainted by my singular experience. Um, so when we were working on our our embedded software in C++. Um, we 
I don't know if I ever saw the code coverage percent. It was, it could not have been high. <laughs> um, setting up the tests, uh, you know, specifically, right? You know, it's, it's, it's some software that's connected to the internet and it has some complex configuration files that detail, you know, all the various layouts of like how to communicate over, over a bus or something. Um, and just the, the, the number of classes and the, the depth of, uh, encapsulment that you had to go through to get stuff working in those tests, ridiculous, just it was a lot um and absolutely whenever i had to update tests because i did a bug fix um 100 of the time i would go to that test file find something else uh control c control v and make whatever tweaks i needed to make um there was there was a zero percent chance that i was going to go out there and start writing my own testing code in c plus plus um and the nice thing about about doing it in elixir by comparison is you know, because it's in this highly multi-threaded model, um, you can kind of just say, hey, spin up a process for me. And the test will be the one that handles sending the messages and getting the configs in and whatnot. And like, it's much less of a worry about having to set up this super complex, like multiple threads connected to each other, sharing data architecture. Um, it's just, here's the here's the module I want to test. I can very easily mock specifically the data that this thing cares about, um, right? Because it's not like there are shared pointers that it might access that's going to be used by other processes as well. It's here's your data, work with it. Um, and that's so much easier to write. Makes a lot of sense. Bonus question. All right. Uh, we're always trying to get more Elixir devs. Any mm -hmm. thoughts on how to get people ramped up faster? Um, okay. When you say ramped up, are, are we are we referring to uh, getting them writing functional Elixir code or getting them interested in the first place? Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, if you feel like you have a good answer for both, I won't say um, no. Let's see. So I think, I hate to say this because I know exactly who it makes me sound like, um, but I feel like the best way to get people interested in Elixir is to write code in Elixir. Uh, some might even say rewrite it in Elixir. Um, but I understand that that can be perceived as uh, an obnoxious advertising model by some, we'll say. <laughs> um, but I think that, I mean, the best way to do it to me would be to just talk about problems and say, oh, yeah, I can think of how to solve that problem, right? Like, that's not a big deal. Um, yeah, there, there's a model, you know, we, we have the, the gen state machine. Um, it's incredible. We love it, you know, come check it out. Um, so, so when I, when I was getting onboarded, when, when we were making the transition and, and, you know, Alex came on board and they were like, all right, we're writing Elixir code now. Um, the way that he got me into it, and this, I think answers both, you know, your question both ways, how do we get them interested and how do we get them writing good code? Um, the way that he got me on board and loving it and you know pumping stuff out of the door pretty quickly was by giving me actual problems right we did not write toy code we never once wrote a gen server that um accepts a command for add and then a number and adds one to it right we didn't do that we you know the uh uh he already had a little bit of a mocked out code base for some of the basics of what we were doing and he said, all right, we need these things implemented. Uh, we're going to pair for three hours today, and we're going to get that thing implemented. And just having that voice there to, you know, say, all right, what are your thoughts on this? How do you think we should approach this? Okay, you know, uh, we have a function that does that, right? Uh, this is just to reduce. How do we want to reduce it? Um, things like that, I feel like, you know, it, because toy problems are good for tourists. Real problems are good for people that you actually want to keep around. Um, so give them real problems, I feel like. 
is is the way to get them interested. Yeah, I, I th thank you so much. So any thoughts on how what uh, how you distribute code? I'm an embedded guy, and a lot of times I run just sticking it in the binary and people just pick up it's less uh, less drama. I mean, I'm not a good person to because I'm going on the dog. But um, I, I don't. I don't know if you guys have a preference or uh, thoughts about uh, you know, distributing things via um, bakeware or I don't know if you have another room, but some other room, mix room, uh, person at all. Um, I don't have too much of a comment on uh, distributing. You know, the you know, uh, my job is we write the code, we deploy it. Um, distributing it, other stuff is not quite within my wheelhouse. I don't know, Alex, do you want to take that one? And by that, I mean, please take it. Yeah, um, let's see. Distributing code could probably be its own other talk, so I'm not sure how how far I really want to go into it. Um, maybe I'll just give the very short answer. Uh, since we're dealing with embedded systems and, and this is the nerve side of things, we're using a lot of the tooling around that. We have CI build the firmware bundles right up into a NERFS firmware image. So you get the .fw file that comes right out of that. And we're distributing that through NERVS Hub is managing the distribution to the devices. And so we're using NERVS Hub deployments to be able to push out that firmware to the devices in the fleet. So hopefully that's the uh, the elevator pitch on our deployment process there without going into uh, too much detail on that. Any other takers? There are 25 of you in here. I know someone else has a question. Yeah, I posted in the chat, but I was just curious if there's things that you oh, build yeah. still in C++, but not in Elixir. Um, in C++ specifically, I... That is a good question. I'm going to go with, I can't think of a specific thing, a specific piece of code, right? Like an application. Um, but I would say that under specific constraints, I would certainly write C++ code instead of writing Elixir code. Um, and that really comes down to the hardware platform that you run on. Um, but Elixir code is, uh, Elixir is pretty good. Um, you can run it on some, some, I don't want to say pretty weak, but like you can run it on some pretty weak hardware. Um, you know, we're we're sitting over here. It's like uh, 500 megahertz and 128 megabytes of RAM, um, and we're not close to straining the system. Um, so, like, if you're if you're in a really constrained system, I would still say C++ stuff. Um, but I mean, I can't think of a use case where I'd be like, yeah. Let's get some C++ up in here. Um, it just, it's just nicer to write in Elixir. Do you, question back to you. Do you have a case that you think of where you're, um, where you're like, oh yeah, I, you know, there's the C++ thing that I feel like just works better. You know, do, do you have something like that in mind? No, not at all. I fully drank the Kool Aid. I am elixir all the way. You're you're in the club. I gotcha. I was just gonna ask if you had to like implement any drivers for your system in C or C plus plus to support your yeah. So like, so, hard, so, stuff like that. so hardware support is a real thing, um, and I think that we were fortunate. And Alex can agree or disagree with me here because I didn't do this. Um, but I think we were fortunate enough that the chipset that we're working with um, had a pretty close chipset that was already supported. Um, but yeah, the the supporting hardware is a real issue. So the nice thing about you know nerve systems is that it is still uh, running on Linux, right? So if we're talking about hardware drivers in that sense, you can still compile in whatever kind of Linux support that you need for those things. Um, if we're talking about, you know, supporting like a specific ARM, who knows what platform, um, that's a little bit different. And that is definitely see what exists and talk to the people that support that stuff to see what they think about those things. Feel free to chime in on that one, Alex. Yeah, I can definitely add to that. Um... 
we couldn't completely escape C, vanilla C. And if you're building a commercial product from the top down, I would say it's not a realistic expectation to be able to escape it completely because like what Ben touched on, Nerves is running on top of embedded Linux at the end of the day. It happens to give you a set of tooling to be able to help build that embedded system quicker and easier than you might have to do elsewhere. Um, it relies on build root to do a lot of that heavy lifting for you. But in part of that, by the time you get down to that level, you're dealing with part of the system before you have access to the beam. And you're dealing with, I mean, Elixir obviously doesn't run uh, or doesn't, uh, the Linux kernel can't run Elixir itself, right, in the kernel. So when you are working with things on that level, yes, uh, you do have to, and we have had to fall back to vanilla C at that point to uh, to do some of that. So, uh, for example, the uh, the system that we're on is the chip, uh, the SAM A5D27. This is the development kit for it. Uh, they sell it either as the individual chip or this system on module. This is one of the nerve systems that I've been supporting um, for a little bit now. And there were some patches in C that had to be made to this nerve system. Uh, so there was a little bit of work there, uh, but overall, not it wasn't too big of a burden. It's um, you have to touch a little bit of it, likely if you're having to go in and customize your own nerve system for your own uh, for your own PCB. If you're working for a company that spends their own PCB, uh, if you're dealing with a dev kit off the shelf, you're probably going to have an easier time. Uh, supporting that. So if you can either build a prototype that's just part of a dev kit that's already supported by Nerves, you can shift that. Or if you're dealing with it at a hobby level and you can just build all your stuff off of a, a dev kit and a breadboard or a dev kit and a little project box, uh, you will probably have, be able to avoid more of that type of code. The other place where it might make sense to use C++ is down in that layer if you need to run something as a C++ sidecar application because it already exists as, as a library that you can pull off the shelf and compile it and run it in your, your system so that you don't have to rebuild that from scratch yourself. And uh, at that point, ideally, you've just got a binary and maybe some shared object files that come out of it so you can drop those into your system. So it's not like you having to write that yourself, but that's a place where you need, might need to pull those elements into your project to be able to use them. In fact, if you want to continue that train of thought, Alex, Joseph just asked a question in chat about um, kind of sidecarring to interface with hardware. Uh, it seems like you're kind of moving in that direction. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's see. Yeah, so Connor Rigby mentioned that most nerves interfaces to hardware were done with ports interacting with C executables that touch the hardware. It, it, that's exactly it. So yeah, is that a general use case in nerves mode? Absolutely. So yeah, if you need to work with a sidecar app using an Elixir port, which is basically a way to hook up to standard in and standard out of an application that you, that you spin up, you can kind of think of it like doing an exec, but it's monitoring that process. Uh, that's a really good way to go about it. And then you've got this other program, possibly in this other language, you're able to communicate to it. Kind of like Ben was mentioning, pipelining feels a lot like using Unix pipes. You've just got that standard in, standard out, right to that other application. You can parse that however you want to. That can be whatever protocol you want to. That's a really, really good way to bring in third-party software, but keep it contained so that it's not getting tangled code-wise into the rest of your system and you can kind of keep everything nicely isolated and yeah, have that good separation between components there. Then I could probably embarrass you with one that Mike said, hopefully. Oh, uh, what, what do you think of this with the things that trip you up? Mm -hmm. uh, let it crash felt like one of those concepts that can take a bit to wrap your head around. Yep. Oh, are you? Are, are you that was a, that was a good, good, great, great answer, Ben. You just summed it up. <laughs> um, are, are you implying that I just haven't wrapped my head around my grapes? Uh, no, I think um, I think the learning curve through that process is one that 
this is what I'm wondering how you how you would explain this. Like, is is that something that people should like go in preparing for or kind of like bracing for going in? It feels like uh, there's that urge when folks go in. I remember, I like I went through it myself, and it's just like, oh man, what if this case happens? What if that case happens? I need to make sure that I'm covering this and that, and whatever. And I don't know. Like I, I'm a little more distanced because I, I went through this longer ago than a lot longer ago than you did. Um, but just like there's this like having to let go of that and just being okay with it and understanding what guardrails, elixir, and the beam give you in that area and really learning to fall back on supervisors and gen servers and things like that. But there's yeah. there's this balancing act that um, that I think like you've really been finding as you've gone through the journey where you can't go completely hands off of it and just say oh something else in my system is going to take care of this. You have to know how to tune your supervisors or when something crashes, maybe this is something I actually need to handle. There's there's a certain element of that where it's it's not completely black and white on that spectrum. It's finding this the the right balance between both of those sides. Yeah, I I, I see what you're getting at here. Um, I think that the most important thing I would say definitely is um, having example code that is supervised and having that there and. I think, I think in my opinion, it's better to start out that way with something that's supervised. And then you can say, um, don't write any error handling. Let it crash and build up from there. I think it's better to uh, go, go, the, go the sink or swim route, uh, just throw them straight into the water. Um, obviously, right? There's not really sink or swim, but to heavily encourage, um, stop all that behavior, stop any of your error catching, uh, just observe and see what happens when we do let things just crash. And once you get that feeling that things can crash and the system can continue, then you can start building up and saying, well, okay, I don't want to crash here. I would rather do something else. Um, as opposed to the other way around where, you know, someone's got their arm floaties on all the time in the water and they never, they never want to take one of them off because, you know, you don't want to give yourself the option of crashing because, ooh, then it's a crash. Um, I think it's better to figure out what crashes are unacceptable rather than what crashes are acceptable. Yeah, that, that's a great way to put it. I think that's a really good way to look at it. Um, also, I guess me kind of answering one of Mike's questions as well. Um, but uh, but I'm interested in your perspective on it, Ben, is when we were going through that Elixir training process, how many how many times were like, what was that experience of of uh, us going in and giving a tour of the language or look how great Elixir is or or that kind of vibe. I feel like you I feel like you mentioned you, you you told me this is that you explicitly didn't try to do that. Um we we came into that training and I'm pretty sure not once did you say, here's this cool thing that you can do. Or, you know, isn't it amazing? Uh Elixir, you know, like wow, look at this, right? It was always uh here's a problem. How do you want to solve it? How do we write that in Elixir code? Um and the entire process of Wow, this is such a cool thing. Um, I know I know that you know this because you witnessed it every time. Um, all of those were internal from me recognizing and like the thing just flipped over in my brain and all of a sudden I saw it. I was like, oh, oh, this is great. Um for for every for everyone else around. Um my most recent moment like that was when we started getting into the uh the gen statum. Erlang module, and all of a sudden, like, I just realized that it was incredible, and you could kind of just do whatever you wanted, um, but like in a good way, 
in a very understandable way. Um, and, you know, that was a little bit at direction, you know, hey, check out this module. Um, we might we might want to be using this module, but it was very much uh, my discovery and my stumbling upon. Wow. This does what I want it to do. This is beautiful. Um, all, all of those moments have been self-generated. Yeah. So that's, thank you, Ben, because that's my answer to the question of what you just said. So for anybody who's um, in the position of either needing to teach Elixir um, or, you know, get folks up to speed on it or is thinking about some kind of training course or something like that, I think that's really the thing to drive for is uh, I, my opinion from the ways that I've typically seen Elixir training happen is we as Elixir engineers get so excited and look at how awesome the language is because we've gone through the curve so recently. And so the first thing we wanted, we're, we're engineers, we're not marketers or salespeople or stuff like that. So the first thing that we want to do is go, well, I think this is awesome. So let me go literally tell everybody, hey, look, this is awesome. Um, but they don't understand necessarily how it applies to them yet. And so that's that's the trick there that I think is important is you don't necessarily need to go around telling people, jump in and show them, help them solve the problems that they're trying to accomplish. And uh, yeah, like what, what Ben and the rest of the folks went through is, um, oh, and also I, I, I've, I know most of you are probably good at this, but there's, I know a, a few people that could probably hear this. Um, also, use empathy and treat the place that the other folks are coming from with respect. So I know there's a whole lot of uh, folks going into Elixir. I see a whole lot of, I never want to touch C or C++ again. The other big one from the website is I never want to touch JavaScript again, right? Like we see that all the time. Um, be really careful with that approach when you're working with folks who are still using those languages and especially who still like those languages. Um, it's it's really about how they can blend in a little piece of Elixir, like exactly what Ben's been saying through this entire presentation of what's the bit that can help them honestly solve their problems in a more productive way. And that's the spot that's going to click with them. So focus on helping them get to that point. And like what Ben just said, it, when you show people how it can help solve their problems, they're the ones starting to say, wow, this is awesome that I can do this. Um, and I, I will just go on the record. Um, I'll, I'll answer Jonathan's question in a second, but I will go on the record and say, um, I still enjoy writing C code, right? I, I, I have not given that up, uh, certainly not in any professional context. Um, that's still a little bit of black magic to me, but it's still enjoyable to write. Uh, I still have fun with it. Um, so, you know, Elixir is great, but it's not going to replace literally every single thing else ever for me. Um, it's just one more tool in your toolbox. Yeah, and it's a great tool, um, but it is just another tool. Um, so let's see, Jonathan's in here asking, um, what, do I, what do I like the most? Like, which, which part of the Elixir dev? Um, and what do I want to explore more? So... I'm going to say um, I have not touched barely anything. Like, I haven't touched any code that uses the Phoenix library, right? We have to talk Phoenix to the server, but on our end, that's pretty much, you know, uh, Slipstream gives us some handlers for a message that came in, and, you know, we send messages back. It's just formatting, you know, the data that, that we want to send to them. So I haven't really touched much Phoenix code. Um, I will say that I am apprehensive about it and I don't really want to do it. Kind of like what I talked about with all the macro black magic. Um, the Phoenix ecosystem, I feel like, is its own language. And while that's cool, um, I'm not there yet. And I don't want to rush or push myself into that. Um, and I haven't... So... Uh, I... I'm not sure about the distinction between backend and nerves here. So the stuff that I have been writing has been the embedded software that goes on our embedded hardware. If that qualifies as nerves code, then obviously that's what I've enjoyed. Um, you know, specifically interfacing like with the nerves libraries and things like that 
I also have not done too much of, although that's probably where I would be moving next as opposed to doing Phoenix stuff. Um, so I hope that that kind of lays that map out for you. For me, for the most part, it's just writing Elixir code for me right now. And that's good enough and I enjoy it. And I'll probably move further into the, the nerves area rather than the website of it. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Ben, for presenting this. It's been awesome. Thank you everyone for showing up.